And in fact, I didn't invite the speaker, Nick did, but I've known Ellen for like four or five years since we were both graduate students. So Ellen um, is from France, and <laughs> she did her undergrad and her um, master in France um, from ITGP. And then she did her um, PhD at uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine. So during her PhD time, she spent most of her time on um, geodesy using uh, interferometrics, synthetic aperture radar to detect uh, surface deformation due to volcanic activity. So she spent most of her time on the volcanic system in Chile. There's a volcanic system called Laguna de Mali. So after her PhD, she has switched her focus on just uh, monitoring those deformations to understand what's the mechanism and how do we use those um, observations to understand the plumbing system, the injection, and the volcanic activity or the cycles. So I, I guess today she's going to cover part of that. So today her talk is about geodetic measurements and numerical models of volcanic unrest and large seismic systems. Let's welcome her. So thanks uh, Mohan and thank you Nick for inviting me today. So I had a great uh, first visit, uh, it was my first visit to the University of Maryland. Uh, so as Mohan said, today I'm going to talk about uh, how we can use geodetic measurements of ground deformation uh, to model volcanic unrest and uh, specifically I will talk about volcanic unrest uh, occurring at large silicic magmatic systems. So, to start with, uh, I'd like to introduce the concept of uh, an eruptive cycle. So, for a typical volcano that erupts uh, regularly, uh, we could define uh, different stages leading to this eruption. So, uh, usually there is a pre-eruptive stage where the volcano is inflating, uh, followed by uh, an eruption, uh, an eruption followed by a sudden deflation of the, of the edifice. This deflation would continue uh, at slower rates until it reaches steady state. So what we would measure uh, at the surface, the ground deformation, would look like a signal like this with uh, uplift, then sudden subsidence uh, until it reaches a steady state. So to complete such a cycle, uh, it, would, it could take about uh, several months to few decades or centuries. Um, now, what I'm going to talk to you today is about large silicic volcanic systems. Some people call them uh, super volcanoes. Uh, they are able to erupt uh, more than uh, 1,000 cubic kilometers of magma, usually during uh, very explosive eruptions of uh, VI greater than 7. So VI stands for uh, Volcanic Explosivity Index. Uh, here this really simple uh, histogram shows the relation between uh, the number of eruptions and uh, the explosivity. So uh, more frequent eruptions are small eruptions and uh, VI 7 or more are, are rare. So actually, uh, VI8 uh, has never been observed in uh, human history. So uh, here, uh, just to show the most, the most, uh, the, la the largest eruptions that have been recorded. Uh, one of the largest one is the Toba eruption that happened 74,000 years ago, and erupted 2,800 uh, cubic kilometer. Uh, so here, I just illustrate that. Uh, these eruptions, they are rare and they have global impact. So not just local impact, but of course they impact the whole, uh, uh, the climate of the, of the whole earth. So now could you, here- Could you give us an example of the four that reached number seven? I assume that they are in human lifetime. The, the uh, VI7, uh, I think uh, VI7 would be, uh, I don't know if I uh, Tombora, I think probably, yeah, Tombora has, so 1850, yeah. And uh, so here is uh, what I propose for an eruptive cycle for large C6 system. So uh, here, uh, <coughs> the problem, as I just said, is that it hasn't been observed in human uh, history, so we have no idea what kind of precursor we expect in terms of surface deformation. What we know, however, is that uh, now that we have uh, geodetic measurements, we know that these volcanoes deform because we're measuring some cycles of uh, inflation and sometimes deflations. So uh, departing from this uh, steady state interruptive phase here, I draw a smaller circle uh, to illustrate those uplift patterns that we measure at these volcanoes. And this is really uh, the, uh, 
what I'm researching, what I'm trying to understand are these uplift patterns. And really the goal is to determine if you're measuring inflation at a volcano, are you measuring one of those uh, non-eruptive inflation or are you actually measuring a pre-eruptive, pre caldera forming eruption uh, inflation? And how can we uh, distinguish between those two? So here is just the same um, problem, but from a monitoring point of view, uh, if you were at a volcano observatory uh, as a geodesist and you're measuring uh, accelerating unrest, like an accelerating uplift, uh, you would have to decide uh, whether to alert the public officials. But um, we have observed many uh, different scenarios. So as you see on this uh, figure, it's, it could be uh, after following an accelerating unrest, it could just go back to sleep or it could kind of plateau, then go back to sleep, or plateau and then lead to a major eruption. For example, the rubble eruption in 1994. <coughs> or it could just continue to accelerate and lead to a major eruption, like Mount St. Helens in 1980 or Pinatubo in 1991. So the overarching research questions I'm trying to answer are what are the underlying processes driving this deformation? And for that, we need to understand how does magma accumulate, evolve, and eventually erupt. So today, I'm going to uh, present two different <coughs> case, case studies. And the first one is uh, the volcanic unrest occurring at Laguna del Maule. So I studied this volcano uh, for the past five years. Uh, this is part of a big uh, multidisciplinary NSF project uh, that aimed to study uh, the dynamics of caldera scale a rhyolitic magmatic system using both geochemistry and geophysical methods. So brief introduction. Uh, here, Laguna del Maule volcanic field is in the southern Andean volcanic zone in Chile, right here. Uh, here uh, in red are the main volcanoes of the frontal arc. So this is the subduction of the Nazca plate beneath the South America plate. Uh, so it's about 200 kilometers east of the epicenter of the Maule earthquake that had occurred in uh, 2010. So here is a simpli simplified geological map. Uh, as the name indicates, it's a volcanic field. It's not just a single uh, volcano, a single edifice. It is many, it's consists in many vents and lava flows and domes uh, that cover an area of about 500 square kilometers. And what I want to uh, point out here is that uh, the most recent activity has been very silicic. So all these uh, pink uh, flows are rhyolite lava flows. So it's one of the largest concentration of uh, rhyolite volcanism. And all these happened in the last 20,000 years uh, during post-glacial times. Uh, something else, uh, so uh, there's a, a lake in the middle called Laguna del Maule. Uh, and in terms of uh, eruptive activity, there was, there's also an old caldera called the Bobadilla caldera here in the north, to the north of the basin. It erupted 950,000 years ago. So uh, mostly it has been covered by a most recent eruptive deposits. There are very few remnants of this caldera. So uh, next, I'm going to show you uh, just some field photos to see uh, what it looks like. One from the north, looking at this flow. Uh, this rhyolite flow uh, over <coughs> there and over here uh, have been dated to being more recent, uh, younger than 2,000 years old. So it's, uh, it's pretty recent. So uh, apart from this amazing geology, the reason why I'm interested uh, is that this uh, volcano is actively deforming. So uh, here, the goal of my study was to quantify the rate of the current deformation at this place, and so understand the processes driving the unrest. OK, so uh, in my research, I used two types of data, uh, GPS and INSAR data. Uh, so uh, INSAR stands for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. Uh, I'm sure that you heard about it from Monghan, so I will just uh, briefly uh, remind you the concept. Uh, we use two different radar images uh, acquired by the same satellite uh, uh, passing over the same area at different time. So an interferogram, I'm going to show you different interferograms, they correspond to the phase difference uh, between these two times for each pixel. So it looks like this. Um, here I show you something clearer. Uh, if this is the displacement vector between two times uh, for a volcano that has moved, uh, what we are actually measuring is what we call the range change. So it it's uh, the, um, the difference in distance between the point and the satellite. So we are, not, we are only measuring a scalar uh, component, which is the projection of this uh, 3D vector on the line of sight of the satellite. So we are measuring this quantity uh, here in black. 
Okay, so actually it's using INSAR that we discovered that uh, this volcano was deforming. So it was the first studied, uh, study was done by Fournier and other in 2010. They conducted a regional INSAR survey. And uh, here I show you an example of what they showed. So between 2003 and 2004 on this interprogram, you cannot detect any kind of uh, coherent deformation. However, looking at another uh, interferogram between 2007 and 2008, you can see here uh, what we call fringes of deformation. So here are about two cycles of colors. And uh, for this specific satellite, one cycle is about uh, 10 centimeters. So this is about 20 centimeters of ground motion uh, towards the satellite, so uplift uh, over a year. So following this discovery, uh, I calculated interferograms starting in 2007 and up to uh, last month. So to follow, uh, to see uh, the, how the deformation changed with time. So here are two more examples uh, from different satellites. This one is called ELOS. Uh, here again, you see the same pattern of deformation, uh, several fringes. This is a three-year interferogram. Uh, this, the deformation is centered, is affecting most of the lake basin. This is a lake contour. So again, the rate is about 200 millimeter if you were to count the fringes. Uh, this one uh, is from Terrasar X. So this is a different wavelength. One fringe being 15.5 millimeter. Again, this is one year, you would get to about 200 millimeter per year. So this is really huge rate of uplift. So we were very surprised to measure deformation. Of, uh, for all these years, and uh, it is still ongoing nowadays, but I'm going to show you some time series uh, later in this talk. First, I want to, uh, so following uh, this uh, discovery, we went in the field and we installed some GPS stations. So GPS stations are used both as ground truth, it's usually used uh, for people, in case people wouldn't believe satellite data, so it's ground. Tr we call it ground truth, but it's also so very useful uh, because we get a better temporal resolution. So INSAR is really good for the spatial pattern, but we only have images depending on the satellite every 11 days or every 22 days. So uh, here uh, at Laguna del Maule, we installed uh, five continuous stations um, and seven uh, what we call campaign sites. So campaign sites are a small benchmark uh, in the rock and they are surveyed every year. So we get one uh, data point per uh, occupation and the continuous station, so this is an example of a continuous uh, GPS station, is just uh, continuously recording so we get daily positions for those. <coughs> Yeah. So for the last photo, so you have a campaign next to a continuous, is it just for um, preparation or? So <laughs> actually, if you see here, in between is a gravimeter. So I was doing a gravity survey uh, next to the continuous station with a campaign GPS. Okay. So uh, yeah, this was related to the gravity survey. Nice. So here's an example of a resulting uh, GPS time series. So here on the y-axis is the vertical displacement x-axis is the time. So you see that all the sites are uplifting through time. Uh, here are the location, uh, it's color-coded. So the fastest uplifting site is here in red, it's called MAU2. And you can see if you uh, calculate a regression line, it's about, over, over this time interval, uh, 194 uh, millimeter per year. So next I'm going to show you a map of these uh, velocity vectors. So if you derive the velocity from this displacement time series, you can get here on the left the horizontal velocity field and on the right the vertical velocity field. Uh, so here we see a typical uh, radial displacement pattern, this typical of inflation. And uh, here you can see what I just showed you, the uh, fastest uplifting site, MAU2, and then the uplift rate uh, decreasing, moving away from, this, uh, from some source somewhere in the middle. So uh, this GPS uh, vector really confirmed what we see in INSAR. This region is inflating. Now, here is the final data set that uh, was published in 2015. Uh, it has since, uh, since then it has been updated. But here, each, uh, each colored rectangle represents one pair of SAR images, so one interferogram. So you see that we have different uh, data sets from different satellites covering a different period of time. So here we want to calculate 
the best, uh, we want to calculate a temporal adjustment over this data set to calculate the best temporal evolution of the vertical displacement. Something to note is that the only constraint we have is that one interferogram indicates zero deformation from 2003 to 2004. So we know that it started sometime between 2004 and 7, which is the first uh, image showing deformation. Here, unfortunately, we don't have the data. And then the GPS starting in, started in 2012. So uh, i just show you the final uh, temporal adjustment on the inside data set. Uh, here, we start from zero. Uh, it started in 2007, and we, what, uh, what I find is that the, the vertical uh, displacement rate or uplift rate has uh, increased uh, kind of exponentially until about 2010, and then it has been slowly decreasing. On this uh, time scale, it's almost linear. So it seems like th that the uplift rate, the velocity, has changed through time. Now here, to put the, the uplift uh, at Laguna del Maule into perspective, I compare it to several other volcanoes. So uh, for Long Valley, Yellowstone and Three Sisters, uh, here on the same x-axis, which is the time since the unrest, you can see uh, that all of them accumulate about few hundred uh, millimeter. Uh, so Laguna del Maule here really stands out as having a really high uplift rate. And they all have different durations. Some of them are very short one year, some of them are really long, three sisters have been deforming for about 15, uh, 15 years. So I also plot the, the, the uplift at uh, Campy Flairy uh, because it, it was a higher rate, higher, the highest rate ever measured actually. So between 82 and 84, it accumulated about uh, 1.6 meter of vertical uplift. So what I did then is uh, I found every uh, a time series for these volcanoes, and uh, I fitted this double exponential model that I was proposing for Laguna del Maule. So I find that this uh, double exponential model is a very common uh, temporal evolution of the uplift. Because so here is an example from the Yellowstone caldera, where where it fits pretty well to the data. As you can see, it has uplifted for five years, and then it started to subside. Uh, for uh, here for three sisters. Uh, this is both an INSAR and GPS time series. Again, the double exponential model seems to fit pretty well. So this similar temporal evolution was the starting point that uh, all these non-eruptive uh, uplifts seem to uh, result uh, from uh, similar processes underground. And uh, after looking at those data, I'm going to uh, talk about modeling the data. Can I understand what your uh, variables are here? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, yeah, I didn't want to go through it because uh, it's, uh, but, uh, so basically here uh, each, so this is an in exponential increase uh, and an exponential decrease, and I estimate the best tau, so tau is the time constant uh, governing uh, the <coughs> uplift. So here tau is 1.3 year for this one, and uh, 5.3 year uh, for the decrease. And then I did, a, I can show you other slides later, I did it for many volcanoes and I compared the different tau. But here, my point was that I wanted to make the point that this uh, nonlinear evolution is common and it hasn't been observed before. Or they have seen the data, but they haven't uh, uh, observed the, the similarity. So in my model, I'm going to reproduce this. And we're going to try to reproduce this. So in order to, um, in order to relate the surface deformation of uh, the surface data, to what's going on uh, underground, we really need to use uh, to model this uh, source underground. So I use a uh, different type of models, uh, both analytic and numerical models. And first, uh, I want to introduce uh, the most famous uh, analytic solution for deformation source. You probably heard about it. It's called the Mogi model. So this is uh, very simple. Uh, it's it considers a pressurized spherical source underground. And it, we, you can see that this analytic solution is quite simple. We can easily calculate the three components of the displacement based on a pressurized uh, source of radius A uh, that experience a change in pressure at depth. And uh, it considers that the medium around it, so the crust, is a half space with homogeneous uh, isotropic material properties. So here, uh, shear modulus G and Poisson ratio nu. Uh, so another analytical solution that has a little more parameters 
is uh, what we call the Okada model. So the solution was proposed by Okada, and it considers a rectangular dislocation at depth. Uh, so this has nine three parameters, the location of the uh, rectangular dislocation, the size, the depth, and uh, the opening and or slip. So this model is used a lot uh, for modeling uh, motion uh, due to earthquakes, but it's also used for uh, sill. So in our case, uh, it was more like a sub-horizontal seal that is inflating. So the, we didn't find any slip, but just tensile opening of this rectangular dislocation. So the exercise was to model each of the interferograms using, uh, using uh, this uh, solution as a, first, as a starting model. And uh, here I just show you an example. This is what the observed um, wrapped face would look like and the model uh, for the ELOS uh, and the residual for the ELOS uh, for the three-year interferogram. So uh, I did this model for the 37 pairs individually, but here what I want to show you is the summary of the best fit parameters. So we find that to explain uh, the, the INSAR data set, we need this uh, rectangular seal sub-horizontal located here, so beneath the more or less beneath the lake was the center, <coughs> the center here. This is the GPS station I, I, I showed you before, and I'm going to keep showing you the time series. Uh, the, uh, it's located at about five kilometer depth to explain uh, the spatial pattern, and it's about five by uh, eight kilometer in uh, dimension. And what we need is a, um, a volume change rate of uh, 29 million cubic meters per year in order to explain uh, the deformation at the surface. So this was the first, uh, first part of the study. Uh, these are called kinematic models. And unfortunately, they do not account for dynamic and time-dependent processes. So we, wouldn't, we need a constant, uh, a constant uh, change in pressure or a constant volume change through time. So we couldn't explain the nonlinearity of our temporal evolution with this type of model. So. Uh, Next, I'm going to introduce you to a, a model that I call the magma injection model, uh, which considers uh, the fluid inside this cavity and a, a fluid flow through a conduit. So uh, here I just remind you that we are trying to explain this displacement with uh, a rate. So this is the first time derivative of, of the displacement. So an increasing rate followed by a, displace, by, by a decreasing rate. So we're trying to explain those surface observation and since we're also considering long-lived large seas existence, uh, we are trying to be in this framework of uh, the MASH model proposed by Hildreth in 2004. So this was a schematic um, done by Brad Singer at the beginning of the project to explain what could possibly be beneath Laguna del Mali. So how does it look like? And if we're trying to really reproduce uh, the arrival of new magma to, to a long-lived chamber, we cannot just measure a pressurized void or a, a dislocation. So uh, following this observation, uh, here I propose um, uh, what, would be, what would correspond to a time-dependent MOGI model. So here was the conceptual model for the MOGI pressurized void. Uh, here is the magma injection model where you would have a fluid field cavity related to conduit. At the base would be some uh, volume flow rate, mass flux, or here I call it inlet pressure uh, imposed at the bottom of the, of the conduit. So the fluid flow would develop in the conduit and uh, the time dependent pressure uh, of the reservoir would exert on the crust and create the time dependent uh, surface deformation. So I'm not going to enter into details, but we can easily um, derive a differential equation for the reservoir pressure that are PO with time, depending on the inlet pressure at the conduit uh, following quasi flow in a pipe. And then we can calculate, we can solve this differential equation with different pressure history. So I'm just showing you the one that fit the data uh, best for Laguna del Maule, which is a ramping pressure. So this is the inlet pressure imposed at the, con at the base of the conduit. Uh, if we have this linear increase and then a plateau, so a ramping inlet pressure, we get this uh, resulting uh, outlet pressure, so reservoir pressure. Uh, the Q is the volumetric flow rate with time. Uh, this is proportional to the difference between these two pressures. So this is the best uh, uh, volumetric flow rate history to explain uh, the INSAR data set at Laguna del Maule. 
and the maximum was reached, uh, maximum flow rate was 1.2 uh, cubic meter per second. Uh, it was reached in 2009, and since then it has decreased. Uh, what you should notice is that even though it's decreasing, Q is still positive. So according to this model, then the, the flow still continues. It only stops where, when the outlet pressure would equal the inlet pressure, and then Q would, be, uh, would reach zero. So here I show you the results. The resulting curve, here the black curve, is the model curve uh, using the magma injection model. Uh, uh, in the background, the dots are the GPS uh, time series for the same station starting in 2012. So uh, after uh, sensitivity analysis and the grid search on the different parameters, I find that uh, if, we con if we consider shear modulus of the crust between 10 and 30 gigapascal, we find that the best fit is reached for a conduit radius between 30 and 60 meter, uh, uh, magma viscosity between 2 to the 10 to the 8 and 3 10 to the 9 pascal seconds. So the next um, the next uh, things I wanted to consider is the compressibility of the magma. So far, we have con considered an incompressible uh, single phase magma, but as we know, uh, magma contains volatile and Although we do not have constraints, uh, we didn't have constraints at this time, I wanted to see how it affects uh, the injection volume estimates. So the one I just show you here is the black case of incompressible magma. In this case, we would have about 190 million cubic meter injected into the system. So new magma added to the system. If we would consider um, a very compressible magma uh, with water content between four and six weight percent, and crystal fraction between 0 0.2 and 0, and 0 0.4, then we could get as much as 360 um, million cubic meter of magma uh, added to the system. So it's probably somewhere in between, but this was a, a good uh, e exercise to see uh, what's the range of uh, volume we can constrain from this magma injection vol uh, model. So this was all uh, the analytic solution because it's a simple, simple shape, shape, a sphere, and a conduit. So we can easily use the uh, derived analytic solution. We can also use numerical models. Uh, so numerical models using finite element uh, method would be more useful uh, to consider different shapes. So more to add any complexity, whether it's about the shape or about the heterogeneities of parameters in the crust. Uh, in my case, uh, I used uh, the numerical model to implement the viscoelasticity of the crust. So uh, something uh, is that so far we consider the crust to be purely elastic, but we know that in volcanic areas, uh, especially in long-lived uh, uh, silicic system or long-lived uh, magmatic system, the, the crust is heated. Uh, it's heated probably above the, the ductile uh, transition. Uh, so it's probably behaving more viscoelastically that than elastically. So uh, here um, I show you the corresponding so initial conditions and boundary condition for the numerical models. Um, here is the the temperature distribution calculated uh, for uh, an, for a system residing at 850 de uh, Celsius degree, and then I calculated the cons um, the corresponding viscosity. So this is the viscosity distribution uh, I applied to the crust. And next I'm going to show you, uh, so the, in the far field, uh, the boundary is the geothermal gradient, and uh, here the imposed temperature at the, at the magma chamber uh, boundary is 850 degrees. So here's the resulting um, vertical displacement time series uh, for different cases. So I tested a uh, homogeneous uh, crustal viscosity, and as I just showed you, the temperature dependent viscosity. So the black curve is the purely elastic case that I just showed you, and the more realistic uh, distribution is probably the, the one depending on the temperature. So here it's, uh, it's the dotted uh, magenta curve. So I don't think we can see, but normally there's an uncertainty in gray around the, around the black curve. So Actually, the viscoelastic model is really at the limit. It's within the uncertainty of the uh, fully elastic model. So in this case, uh, the viscoelasticity of the crust didn't impact the uplift time series uh, at Laguna del Mole. So 
Um, I'm going to talk to continue talking about modeling and I'll go one step further with another kind of model. But uh, for that, I'm going to uh, show you another case study, which is the one at uh, Long Valley Caldera in California. All right, quick introduction. So Long Valley Caldera, it's uh, located here in the eastern escarpment of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, it is about 15 by 30 kilometer here outlined in blue. Uh, it was formed 767,000 years ago, uh, following the famous uh, eruption of the Bishop Tuff. And uh, there is here in yellow a resurgent dome. So this uh, resurgent dome uh, up has been uplifted by about 400 meters, uh, starting after the caldera forming eruption and up to 570,000 years ago. And uh, generally, uh, here is a simplified uh, geological map. Uh, the eruptive centers have moved uh, west, southwestward through time, started, starting with the Glass Mountain Rhyolite, uh, the uh, Bishop Tuff, and the early Rhyolite uh, in the caldera. But currently, now, more recently, the activity has focused uh, in the northwest, so in the Mono Inyo uh, crater uh, chain here in red. So the unrest is uh, characterized by uh, two main uh, observations, geophysical observations. It's characterized by the presence of seismic swarms uh, that are focused uh, here in the southern uh, segment of the rainfall zone. And um, it's also characterized by modern uh, deformation that is centered on the resurgent dome. So this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, what is uh, creating this deformation? Um, the, on the next slide, I'm going to be showing you the length change between these two sites. Uh, the horizontal baseline length change through time. So you see these two sites are on each side of uh, an inflating region. So if you look at the length change of the horizontal baseline, it's equivalent to looking at the amount of uplift. So ground deformation at uh, Long Valley has been uh, Long Valley has been monitored for a long time, starting in 1975. So it's one of the longest time series available for uh, volcanic unrest. It has been monitored with different uh, geolithic techniques, leveling, EDM, GPS. And as you see here, it has been uplifting, but not at continuous rates. So we can determine different deformation episodes based on uh, the observation I made. Uh, here, I define one episode as an increase in rates followed by a decrease in rate. So we can count, count about five, uh, not about, but five of them. Um, so with different uh, durations, some of them are short, some of them not, and different magnitudes. Uh, here I'm going next to model uh, those episodes. I'm just uh, going to ignore uh, episode four because it was uh, quite minor and it's actually, it was followed by some subsidence. So in total, it didn't really accumulate uh, any vertical displacement. So before I introduce the model, uh, here I put together uh, uh, different uh, schematic cross sections found in many different papers and so the main uh, the general idea about what it looks like beneath a uh, long valley uh, would be a, a partially uh, molten uh, magma chamber usually shown in red or in uh, yellow around it would be some um, already crystallized or partially crystallized uh, magma uh, most importantly feeding this uh, magma chamber uh, people uh, consider that there are new magma injection, more uh, mafic, more uh, basaltic, coming from depth. So, the common observation is a crystallizi crystallizing magmatic mush and the melt layer fed by magma injections. And for the geodetic studies uh, of uh, the Long Valley unrest, most of them considered very simple models, but they all find that an ellipsoid deformation source beneath the resurgent dome, uh, located at about uh, six or seven uh, kilometer depth, explain the spatial pattern uh, pretty well. So this is an example of this ellipsoid deformation source from Battaglia uh, 2003. Now, more recently, uh, very recently, in 2017, Wes Hildreth uh, proposed a different scenario. Uh, according to him, uh, the it's the crystallizing magmatic mush that releases uh, supercritical fluids. And it's the pressurization of the layer above by these fluids that, that leads to deformation. 
So the more, most importantly, according to this uh, scenario, there would be no recent magma input anywhere beneath the caldera. So after uh, reading this paper and uh, talking to Wes Hildreth about it, I thought uh, that I want to test these two hypotheses. Can we say anything from the geodetic point of view? So the question is, what causes uh, the observed transient deformation signal? And the two hypotheses are uh, episodic basaltic intrusions into a crystalliz crystallizing mesh create those pulses of deformation, or is the supercritical fluids generated by the exsolution of fluid that are injected into a permeable layer above the mesh. And so I'm going to be modeling the temporal deformation of the deformation that I just showed you uh, using pore elastic models. Uh, in both cases, I um, will be modeling the flow of fluid, either magma or water, uh, through porous rocks. Okay, very brief introduction to uh, pore elasticity. Uh, you probably know that fluid flow through uh, porous media is governed by uh, Darcy's law. Uh, simple uh, here on this simple sketch, uh, the discharge rate Q is proportional to the permeability of the medium, uh, cross-sectional area A, and the pressure drop between these two points, uh, inversely proportional to the fluid viscosity, and the length over which this pressure is uh, dropping. So a magma reservoir can really be considered as a porous medium. Uh, it's really an interconnected uh, pore system that's saturated with uh, fluid, in this case, magma. Now, pore elasticity, it, uh, cons it relates the fluid flow and the solid deformation of, uh, within the porous medium. So it's a, a two-way two coupling between the changes in stress and the changes in fluid pressure. So uh, in this study, uh, Darcy's law and pore elasticity equations were uh, coupled and solved nu numerically uh, using the FEM uh, modeling software package COMSOL Multiphysics. Okay, here the two conceptual models, uh, both scenario, the magma scenario, the water scenario, showing you uh, the different initial and boundary conditions uh, at the base of the mesh. Uh, so these are 2D axisymmetric models. So these rectangles uh, are like cylinders uh, of the crust. So like a porous cylinder a region in the crust. Uh, at the base is a, a time-dependent uh, magma uh, flux and water flux in this case. And um, next I will show you uh, what I find out uh, by running different uh, sensitivity analysis of the various parameters is that what controls the magnitude and the time scale of the uplift is this ratio uh, of the permeability over the viscosity. So I call this magma mobility. In, uh, usually in oil, in petroleum engineering, uh, they call it the oil mobility, so I call it the magma mobility. And um, here on this graph, you can see I, I draw the resulting uplift curve uh, based on different ratio of magma mobility. So the highest this ratio, uh, we have higher ratio lead to a more deformation and shorter time scale, so shorter tau. Now, uh, in the study, I adjusted the, these three parameters, the permeability of the mesh, the viscosity of the fluid, and the volume flow rate at the base to recreate this uh, history of surface deformation. So I vary these between <coughs> ranges um, according to uh, found in the literature. Permeability of mesh is varied between 10 minus 8 and 10 minus 12 uh, square meter. Uh, the magma viscosity, uh, assuming uh, basalt uh, magma, uh, depending on the temperature, could vary between 5 and 100 pascal seconds. And the volume flow rate is uh, adjusted to fit the time series. Uh, the crustal parameters, shear modulus, Poisson's ratio density are uh, kept constant. So, okay, for scenario one of the uh, new magma uh, flowing into a mesh, here is the resulting time series in red. Uh, in gray is the data that I showed you uh, earlier. So the fit is quite good and it is, uh, it's reached by having kappa uh, permeability of 10 minus 8 and uh, viscosity of 5 pascal seconds. It corresponds to, this is the volume flow rate history that was necessary to explain all these episodes. So what you see is that in order to have this nonlinear increase and decrease in deformation or volume change, we need a linear increase in Q followed by a decrease. So uh, each of these maximum Q for each episode correspond to the inflection point between uh, increasing rate and uh, um, decreasing rate. 
The maximum queue was reached uh, during the 97-98 uh, episode of deformation. It was 3.9 uh, cubic meter per second. So the most important uh, result is how much uh, total volume of magma was needed. And uh, if we integrate Q over time, we find that a cumulative volume of uh, 0 0.9 uh, cubic kilometer of magma was needed uh, in 42 years to explain uh, the surface deformation. So, okay, let's talk about scenario two. Uh, scenario two was about the, uh, the isobaric fluidic solution, or so-called second boiling. Uh, so, as I said, the long-term crystallization of magma leads to a water-saturated melt and later to the exolution of uh, water phase. So, uh, since we are at uh, 6 km depth, or 4 km depth, uh, about 100 megapascal for the pressure, uh, 600 degree uh, for the fluid, we are above the critical point for water. So here we assume that the dominant uh, volatile phase is H2O. Uh, so, uh, supercritical uh, water has different physical properties than liquid water. Uh, here the density is set to 400 uh, kilo per uh, cubic meter, uh, so lower than uh, liquid uh, water, and the viscosity is closer to the gas viscosity, so 0 0.45, 10 minus 4 uh, pascal seconds. Here is a resulting time series for the magma uh, case. So you see that the same fit is, uh, is obtained, we just had to scale uh, the Q, so we had to multiply uh, the volume flow rate of magma by 0 0.12, so much lower. Here the permeability was kept to 10 minus 8 and we get, again, we get the same fit. So just the same uh, history of pulses of fluid, but this time we need much less volume. So remember, this is a much uh, smaller layer and at a shallower depth. Uh, here, uh, the total volume estimated for, of water, of supercritical water, would be 0 0.112 uh, cubic kilometer in 40, 42 years. And I did the same, uh, the same uh, test as for Laguna del Mole, which is what is the influence of the viscosity on the result? So uh, here is the temperature distribution and viscosity distribution for both cases. So here is a magmatic mush uh, at about 700 degrees. And here is a much cooler uh, and smaller area where the water would be injected. Uh, what you see on the right is the resulting uh, volume time series. So the volume estimate for the elastic and viscoelastic uh, case are very different for the case of the magma, magma magmatic mush. However, for the water, it has less influence. So uh, here we have a much cooler and much smaller area. Uh, in I forgot to mention, but in these models, both the um, the rock matrix of the porous domain and the surrounding crust is considered viscoelastically. So here it would be uh, very important to consider viscoelastic uh, relaxation of the crust in the case of a uh, uh, long-lived uh, uh, magmatic mush that is hot. So yeah, volume estimates uh, are divided by 1.3 to 6 depending on the case. So now I want to interpret those results to see which one is uh, more likely and uh, uh, can we create this 0 0.1 uh, cubic kilometer of water or 0 0.9 cubic kilometer of uh, magma. So uh, I ran a few uh, melt uh, simulation uh, in order to simulate the crystallization of a rhyolite uh, of a bish average bishop tough composition. So uh, how to read this graph? Uh, here the temperature on the x-axis uh, if, we start, if we start at uh, 900 degrees and we decrease the temperature, so it's first nothing happened and then it starts to crystallize. So uh, when you hit 790 degrees, the solid uh, volume fraction is increasing and the, the liquid, the melt, is uh, decreasing. But uh, what I was interested in is to calculate how much water can be created by this crystallization to see if it's realistic or not. And what I find is that 8% uh, of the initial melt volume could be absorbed as supercritical water. So it means that we would need the crystallization of uh, 1 cubic kilometer of melt to get 0 0.087 cubic kilometer of water, which was uh, this number here. Okay, so now uh, we need to... Uh, 
we need to determine which uh, scenario is more likely. And as I just showed you, both uh, geodetic time series can be fit by both models. So we really need to look at other uh, evidence, and in that case, uh, geological evidence. So there are two main observations that are uh, interesting to point out. First, there is no uh, helium-3 or CO2 signals in the caldera. This was noticed by Wes Hildreth. Uh, that since there is no degassing <coughs> at the surface, and it's, it, this would be expected uh, in the case of uh, having more uh, mafic uh, magma coming to the reservoir. There's also, there hasn't been any eruption uh, within the caldera for the last 500,000 years. I showed you at the beginning how the eruptive centers have moved. So it seems like it would be unlikely to have those uh, volumes of magma uh, getting to the caldera without those signals. However, I then calculated a simple thermal model of a large... Uh, so this is a picture of what we think uh, it could look like prior to the Bishop of Erup Eruption. So a large 300 cubic kilometer reservoir uh, that is cooling in Comsol, uh, 300 degrees can uh, easily be achieved in less than, than uh, 0.5 million years. Uh, so it seems like scenario two uh, is more likely based on, uh, based on this observation. So, uh, however, the fluid release and the crystallization would be a secular process. So you could wonder why we would have these pulses of uh, fluid exclusion uh, and have those pulses of deformation. So one possible hypothesis, so si this is still ongoing work, so if you have ideas, you can always uh, tell it to me later. But uh, now we are thinking to invoke the role of default because every, uh, each deformation episode is uh, accompanied by those earthquake swarms. And this would be a mechanism to release uh, some uh, fluid. Actually, um, the seismic studies have invoked in a paper that uh, friction reducing pulses of low viscosity fluids are necessary to explain those swarms. So that would fit with the supercritical uh, water being injected along those faults. Now, okay, so I just want to summarize uh, what I've been telling you about modeling, uh, first we started with a very uh, simple model of a pressurized void. It is still nowadays the most uh, widely used model to model surface deformation and geodetic data. Uh, then I proposed to uh, fill this cavity with fluid, pure fluid and a conduit. And this was in order to recreate uh, the temporal evolution, the time dependent uh, deformation at the surface. However, still very unlikely for a specific specifically for those systems, to have 100% of magma. So uh, here I propose a pore elastic model, which now consider uh, a zone with different porosity and permeability, in which we have, again, the same time-dependent mass flux. So since we know that most magma reservoirs consist in crustal rocks with different volume fraction of partial melt, uh, I think that free flow and pore elastic deformation uh, would be a good uh, modeling fr framework to model uh, the deformation due to pressurization of magma reservoir. Uh, it allows for more realistic volume estimates of uh, magma and or fluid injection. And I think for the future, more importantly, you can imagine how you can have a time-dependent porosity, time-dependent uh, viscosity and permeability. So it will really allow us to link those mechanical models of crustal deformation to other uh, thermodynamic and multi-phase models of uh, magma chamber processes. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. Before we ask her any questions, I realized I forgot to say after she finished her PhD in 2016, <laughs> she became a postdoc at uh, Carnegie. <laughs> And then um, some months ago this year, she got, she was promoted to a staff scientist. So that means she will be here for a while. So I guess if we have if we have more questions about her work, we can, you can come we, back, or she can come back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Yeah. So why doesn't the volcano fail? Why doesn't it produce pressure? Why doesn't the volcano fail? Why doesn't why is there no action? Why does it keep releasing pressure without any observable features in terms of like, I guess, gas or anything? So in this case, I didn't show any uh, calculation of stress, but simply it will fail when the stress exceeds the, the, 
the threshold, uh, the failure uh, criterion of the cross. So in this case, we didn't reach that stage. Otherwise, it would be um, erupting. But well, are you asking why it's not? The, but there's always a continuous release or displacement. The displacement is either changing, increase, or, or decelerating. Right? It's, 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 it's moving down. So when you calculate. Uh, so uh, yeah. just to be clear, it's not subsiding. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, we would need to either have an eruption or mm -hmm. degassing or some kind of uh, hydrothermal phenomenon. It's uh, still uplifting, just at a slower rate. Oh, okay. So actually, I'm making the wrong one. It's not subsiding. It's uplifting, just slow, more slowly. Yeah. The second question, I guess, is connected to that. Is um, you assume right the particular elastic property of the cross, but but you need um, not know that to know when the figure happens. So for example, if you assume that the cross is elastic or not elastic, there's differences in your in the interpretation of those rates. So is there any other way you can make that? measurement on the actual properties of the cost. Uh, are you asking how, how we can measure the rock properties? I well, sorry I didn't exactly get to other than assuming it beforehand. Oh yeah for yeah. sure. We should uh, I should use any um, any other constraint from other uh, other geophysics or, or geochemical uh, so if there were experiments on rocks, it's always uh, hard to relate a single uh, experiment of a piece of rock and then a, a large uh, portion of the crust. But uh, for example, here the next idea is to use results from seismic tomography who have uh, velocity anomalies. So how, how much is the velocity reduced? So other geophysical techniques can be also used to constrain where is melt, how much, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. So, so you're trying to to distinguish between these two hypotheses, and you prefer the one with the fluids as opposed to the magma. So far, yeah. Would uh, would there be? I'm thinking of like other ways of checking this. To me, it's I don't know if I heard you right, but but um, uh, with the fluid, you said that it, there, there's a shallower signal. Or in your modeling, you had something more shallow than. Oh, because the the, the hypothesis proposed by Wes Hildreth is that. Yeah, it's the fluids come from the crystallization of the marsh, so yeah. and they are injected uh, above. The, so that's why I'm just modeling because just to be clear, I'm not uh, modeling uh, the fluidic solution. I'm modeling um, a flux of water that, that would come from below to above. So that's why uh, it would be unrealistic to um, to model the <coughs> same marsh and water here because we are really looking yeah. at water. So, but, but Exactly. So, but wouldn't you expect different uh, geographical patterns of the uplift depending on the two models? Like, wouldn't the Actually, one that's shallower be more localized, and the one that includes a deeper injection be more widespread? Or am I being Actually, so I'm still working on the spatial pattern, but uh, it's pretty similar uh, right. because what, what matters really is the top of the of the mesh. So, it's the interface. So in geodesy, it's very hard to uh, constrain the thickness of. Uh, so I always base my uh, my uh, dimensions, or, uh, especially of the thickness, on different data because uh, you can't constrain the thickness. You can constrain a volume change on uh, because what matters is the roof of the magma chamber on the deform on the surface deformation. So I'm not imagining where there is magma. I'm, imag I'm imagining the deformation of the boundary. So yeah, it's hard. And another good question, if, if you have a kilometer, you're adding cubic, for the magma you need to add a cubic kilometer of magma? Uh, uh, no, one. Uh, what, what did you say? 0 0.9, yeah. So one cubic kilometer, so wouldn't you see that in the gravity? Well, so this is long valley, so yeah, they are kind of old data and some recent results, but I haven't had them. I am not working uh, Long Valley, uh, I'm just using uh, USGS data, so I haven't been uh, doing any measurements. Okay. It's just modeling. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. But, but there should be, right? But like exactly, I think okay. the next step is, what does the gravity say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Now there's a problem. Okay, right. So I was struck that you're looking at two places um, that were glaciated. Um, both in Chile and Long Valley, and actually for that matter, Yellowstone, and that your model you just presented has a sensitivity to pressure. So I was wondering the if uh, you might want to look into the past and see if the glaciation, deglaciation period and the uh, effects that that had on pressure 
um, might have influenced the uh, volcanism that yeah. occurred in the place. Yeah, no, you're right because uh, we 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 do know that uh, like in the northern US, is still uh, the post glacial rebound is a yeah. is a real signal in geodesy. However, the the scale is uh, several orders of magnitude smaller. Okay. Actually, also the at Laguna de Morley, we are a little below the the glaciation, mm -hmm. uh, but still it would be rebounding. But it would be few millimeter year. So now we we have uh, observed uh, more than two meters of uh, vertical uh, uplift. So. Mm -hmm very different scale also because it wouldn't be just focused on Laguna del Mole, it would be regional. Mm -hmm. So I think in our case it would be noise because it wasn't, yeah. <coughs> and the uh, Long Valley, I'm not sure about the glacial history. <laughs> so I'm going to be really provocative. Okay. I already have my own answer in my head, I want to hear your answer. What you just told me was don't give money to you, but give it to the geochemist who can measure the CO2 and helium-3 flux. Is that right? Well, no, because <laughs> when it in the absence of signal, it can never be sure. That I'll be say it again, please. <laughs> I couldn't hear it or something. Even in the absence of those signals, uh, so just based on these two signals, you cannot define if there is magma injection. I'm trying to put all the pieces together, but... Uh, I think but it would seem just like that alone really would be. Is, if there's helium free, there's a hazard. Well, if no. There's no helium free, there's no hazard. It's more hazard? one. It's Hilton's statement. I, I, I don't think so because, uh, well, I don't know if you read his paper, but there are 20 ar arguments. This is one of them. I think it, by itself it wouldn't be strong enough. Otherwise, we would just monitor volcanoes by measuring CO2. Yes, and right. uh, also, this, in, this just indicates that there's new magma coming from depth, but those are non-eruptive episodes, so it's not about hazard. Uh, this just indicates what kind of magma and where it comes from, but yeah, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> I think the fact that it's deforming is one, uh, one evidence, and then if there is degassing or not, and seismic activity or not, so I think there is a reason why a volcano observatory have a three component every time. So deformation, gas uh, monitoring, and the seismic. And we're still, I, I don't have the answer, otherwise we would know how to predict eruptions. But we're still trying to understand these three signals coming from everywhere. So yeah, I don't have an answer. <laughs> so a lot of your models that have magma injection have what magma in been injected from somewhere. Yes, I so know. I'm kind of curious a little bit, that boundary conditions, the idea that like the constant pressure or pressure ramp at great depth that was forcing magma in, and what's the justification for that? To me, it seems that if the magma is being injected into the system, it has to come from somewhere, whatever the reservoir, whatever the source, yeah. its pressure is actually decreasing as the magma is being as injected, goes. right? Because the source itself is losing the material. So, so it what's depends. What's the justification for that pressure boundary? There are many different uh, thoughts and I'm also, so we don't know. So uh, all the time in my models, uh, I consider the whole thickness of the crust. And yes, when you don't know, you always make it come from below. So uh, it, the idea, depending if you're looking at the subduction zone or it would be that melt is coming. Now, some people always model a constant flux. They, they think, no, it's coming at constant flux. Some people have a time varying flux because it does explain the rest, uh, the time varying uh, properties. And uh, in my mind, uh, well, melt come from, uh, come from um, below. So either another storage area, so a l larger chamber. And in my mind, I don't see a reason why it would be a constant flux because looking at the crust for me, it would be more like um, <coughs> Uh, they are blockage and then sometimes it's really so this is what I imagine as pulses of uh, magma uh, when it reaches some pressure it's in the crust and it's complicated pathways and then sometimes it's released so then it goes up and yeah so if I follow on this if you have a large place <coughs> releases magma from that uh -huh. that place may be deflating yeah but it's so we're talking yeah in, uh, in the case of um, so there's an interesting study in Iceland Grimsvatten is a volcano uh, double magma chamber. So yes, there is a model, but both are uh, shallow. Uh, now, if we are talking about something, well, it's also e an easy explanation because if it's 30 kilometers, then we wouldn't see anything. But in the case where both are shallow, yes, you do see deflation from uh, the one where the magma comes from and then inflation from the one. Uh, so it's really cool. 
It's, it's a sombrero, they call it sombrero uplifting. Um, this tape needs to be the last question. So you started off talking about the volcano explosivity index and tying these things to actual eruptions, right? So turning this on its head and saying, okay, what kind of signal for, should the USGS or the people who are monitoring volcanoes be looking for to say, okay, now it's time to issue a warning and get, get serious? It's hard. Like, for <laughs> for calder forming eruption or eruptions in general? Well, so like looking at looking at this this um, eruption history, where did they actually issue warning? For what? example, at Laguna del Maule, uh, we started to study it, and uh, it they raised the alert alert to uh, to yellow when there was both uh, tremor, new tremor, the uplift was still accelerating. So then they raised the alert to yellow, and now. Then the uplift rate started to decrease, and also it, it happens it, uh, that the seismicity has started to decrease too. So it's back to green, but it's still actively inflating. But it's not so. I think it's about the acceleration, but I think they have a really hard job because I wouldn't be able to uh, decide because you don't want to evacuate people every time the uplift accelerates. So it's also based on the history of the, this given volcano. So for example, Long Valley, we know that it uplift and then nothing happens. So if it's, uh, I, I guess they compare, they have a baseline. So the longest the time series, the best you can predict. Long, um, Laguna del Mali is very new. So we didn't even know it was active. It wasn't on the Smithsonian list of volcanoes. Now we know it's actively uplifting. So when the episode is finished, then we'll know how to compare the next one, but uh, yeah. Okay, now is uh, thanks Elaine again. And then Thank you.